Back again, better late than never. I am back from my out of town trip for Thanksgiving, uh, and I am ready to talk Mavericks at Phoenix. Now, the Mavericks get a seven point win in this case, bouncing back after a pretty solid drubbing by the Clippers the other night. And it's their first win since October of 2015 in Phoenix. It had been that long, more than four years since Dallas had won in Phoenix, which is incredible. And I, I, before I call out a couple other things here, I wanted to play some audio here because this is this is something that I saw circulating on Twitter uh, after the game. This was something, just a reminder, something that just completely flew by. Obviously, we know Phoenix was one of the teams, obviously, having the number one overall pick. They take DeAndre Ayton. They're, I think, I could be wrong, but it sounds like their flagship radio station absolutely trashed the idea of Luka when they won the lottery, when Phoenix won the lottery and knew they were going to have the number one overall pick. Trashed Luka in a way that you haven't heard other people get trashed. Like, of all the prospect talk of anyone who said, hey, this is why we're justifying this move, nobody was as outlandishly, like, just lying <laughs> as the Suns were and it's like they're trying to reinforce this idea of like, no, 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 we don't want, we don't have any interest in this European player. We want DeAndre Ayton. That's cool. That's that's your bed to make, but you don't have to trash the kid. Here's the audio from it, and you'll understand why this had to have been a satisfying thing for Luca to go into Phoenix and drop essentially one rebound shy of a 42 point triple double. This is going to be a career defining selection for Ryan McDonough. Get this right. And he's you not going to do. He's not going to take a mentally and emotionally unprepared player that cries during games, that has been been told to me that is he's an entitled brat, completely full wow. of himself, that teammates don't like as his number one overall pick. Are we talking about Josh Rosen or Luka Doncic? <laughs> yeah, Luka Doncic. Okay, because it sounds like you're reading the bio not, of Josh no. Rosen there. Very, for a second. very immature, not mentally wow, or emotionally prepared. Cries during games, full of himself, entitled brat. Teammates don't like him. Not athletic. Wow. I started looping again. Wow. Um, have heard and seen literally zero support for that. Uh, this is, it, it's one thing if it's just someone trying to justify making their pick. And I think DeAndre Ayton will be a pretty good player. But if, it, if you're sitting there at this point, it's okay to admit, like, hey, we still like the guy we got, but, yeah, we didn't see that coming. But to go out there and just outlandishly, like, blatantly lie like that is kind of amazing to say. Selfish player, teammates don't like him. You know, we, we know he's not a stupendous athlete or anything like that, but neither was Dirk. The fact that he's so good is actually more of a compliment in that regard, that he's so dominant despite not having explosive athleticism. He doesn't have to be a LeBron or a Westbrook. I mean, Harden's game's not built on athleticism. It's built on just understanding good footwork, how to create space, in Harden's case, getting fouled and going to the line. And I know a lot of people like to draw comparisons with Luka and Harden, and Luka has said as far as like the step-back game and as far as drawing some contact for fouls, he has modeled elements of his game after Harden in terms of that. I get that, but it's not apples to apples all the same. And even then, it just shows like you you can you can dominate a game, even if you're not an explosive athlete. So the fact that you have these Suns uh, radio broadcasters from I, again, I think it's their flagship station, just utterly raking Luca across the coals and saying that he's a terrible teammate, he's not an athlete of any kind, uh, he cries during games, he's selfish, dude, get over yourself like it's fine to support your pick i'm not gonna harp on this too much longer just like that's that's impressively distasteful and just outright you know blatant falsehood lying and you know what it makes it makes it that much sweeter now anytime dallas beats phoenix i'm gonna remember that and i'm just gonna be a little bit more satisfied hearing those idiots have to then go on the next day and say well you know luca Luca's pretty good. He might have gotten us a little bit. But then, like, trying, because you know how these people do. They're going to try and back it up and act like they weren't completely wrong. They'll act like there was a kernel of truth to what they're going to say. And so they'll be like, yeah, but you know, poor Zingas. Poor Zingas is struggling. And how much of that do you think is on Luca? I think Luca's part of that. Dude, 
it, it's ridiculous what they're going to reach for. But never mind the idiots out there who talk about that nonsense and who spread lies and falsehoods. Here we deal only in the objective, straightforward truth. And that is what we're going to focus on here. Dallas is 120 to 113 victory in Phoenix. Luka, 42 points, 11 assists, 9 rebounds, 12 of 24 shooting, 15 of 18 at the line. I think he was only something like 3 of 9 or 3 of 10 from 3. Uh, let me see here. 3 of 11 from 3. So still a little more dependent on that element than I would like, but all the same, dominant in this game. And uh, he had to be because his supposed to be number 2 running mate did not have a single made field goal in this game. Kristaps Porzingis, 13 rebounds. Hey, that's nice. Three blocks. Hey, two steals. Hey, two points. Zero of eight from the field. Zero of six from three. Two of two at the line. Ooh, that's, that's no good. But one thing I do love about KP is even with, rather than crying about stuff, rather than, and I don't say crying as in like, I mean, he's literally crying and I'm trying to disparage him in any mean. I mean, rather than being upset and caught up in his feelings, basically everything that Knicks fans and media told us he would do if he struggled or anything in that regard, if Luka was getting more shine than him, rather than doing any of that at all, he's actually taken the fact that he is struggling offensively and he's pouring all that energy into rebounding, rebounding better than he's ever rebounded in his career, and into his defensive game as well. And yeah, that shows how even when he's, his shot isn't falling for Jack on some nights, and this is one of his, obviously, I think this is the only game this year he's been held out of the way in terms of even a made field goal. Even when he's not doing hardly anything offensively, he's still impacting the game in other positive ways for the Mavericks. And that's huge as he works his way back. I'm not hitting the panic button yet. I know this is a, a particularly red blemish, so to speak, on his season and on his uh, reintegration into NBA basketball and all that. I get it. But I'm not panicking yet. It, again, I, I already said, until we get into the new year, I'm not really going to start going, okay, I really need to see you start turning a corner now. I, I pretty much am keeping that same expectation I entered the season with, which is what I was saying. Around the New Year's when I expected him to start finding his his legs a little bit under him in terms of his shot, in terms of his offensive game. And once we get that, I'll feel good. But I'm not going to panic on it. In the meantime, I'm just pleased he's still being a positive impact for us elsewhere. I think we also need to have a conversation now about Tim Hardaway Jr., the starter, because Tim Hardaway Jr. as a starter is, uh, is balling. Off the bench, he was atrocious last season. But as a starter, this is uh, from at Nick Van Exit on Twitter. He's talking about the last five games in particular. 20.2 points on 60% from the field. Hey, for someone who said he wanted to be the Michael Finley to KP and Lucas Dirk and Nash, that's how you do it. 20 points, and here's his stat line in those five games. 20 points on 6 of 7, 16 points on 6 of 8. 31 on 10 of 18. Then you had the Clippers game where no one for Dallas really looked good. Luka was the high point man with 22, and that was almost solely at the line. I think he had like three made field goals in the game. Uh, eight of eight points on three of eight shooting in that game. And then in this Phoenix game, 26 points on eight of 14, and that includes six of nine from three. The dude is dealing right now, and I'm glad that even after he had that game, like I said, with the rest of the team where he struggled immensely, Rather than get caught up or dejected by that, you didn't see it just like, boom, hit a brick wall, and now his shot is kind of wonky again, or it falls much more to the median of what we would expect. He's basically kept his stride, and that's really good to see. It's good to see that he's firing on all cylinders because this is going to make a big difference for Dallas if they can have a consistent third guy. And in terms of any consistency at all this year for that role, he's been the leader, so... Hey, there's something to look forward to there. Uh, you also had Seth Curry. Not a great shooting game, but I like still that he gave you essentially 10 points and 7 boards. That's not typical for him to get you that many rebounds. So that's a good lift as well here. Luka's averages. I, I forgot to shout out this stat earlier. I shared this on the page uh, earlier today on the community tab. Luka's November averages now that the last November game is done for Dallas. 32.4 points per game, 10.3 rebounds, and 10.4 assists. 
He is the third player in NBA history to average a 30-point triple-double for a calendar month, which is a minimum of five games, which, yeah, for a calendar month, I'm assuming, I mean, I guess if a guy's injured or suspended or something, then he won't play at least five games. But regardless, uh, Luka balling and doing things that really nobody has ever, well, hardly anybody has ever done. That's something to put a lot of focus into there. This was a this was a good game for Dallas. Like they had their struggles, they had to overcome a deficit in the second half, but they made it work. And Luca was the you know the real engine behind this game for Dallas here. Tim Hardaway Jr. F- filled in the role of the second man and did so wonderfully. This was Monty Williams, Phoenix's coach, after the game. He says he's talking about Luca. He says he's moving into that category where everybody's not surprised by him anymore, and he's still putting up these video game numbers. If I had hair, I would pull it out. That's pretty much how much most any opposing team or coach is going to feel dealing with Luka on a night-to-night basis. People who wanted to say, oh, the Clippers figured it out, man. The Clippers, they they gave the blueprint on how to shut Luka down. The Clippers have like three perennial lockdown perimeter defenders. And then several other guys who are quality, long, athletic defenders who can get physical with you. So what the hell are you talking about when you want to say they have the blueprint? It doesn't matter if you have a blueprint when only one, maybe two teams in the league have the personnel to actually employ the bl- the blueprint. Like, come on. Don't be ridiculous about it. If they had the blueprint, then why did he just go for 42 points, 11 assists, and 9 rebounds? He didn't shoot the ball great from three, neither did KP, but you know what? The team is making a significant, a significant impact, and they're keeping momentum, I feel, largely on the back of just his his phenomenal historic month here. I was talking with, uh, as I was visiting with family, I was talking with my Uncle Justin, who is a sports writer in Oklahoma, and... You know, his observation and everything. I got to watch a good deal of this game. I'm not going into the, in particular, the nitty gritty and everything. I've gone through and I've seen the summaries of the parts I missed, watched back everything like that. But in my conversation back and forth with him regarding the game, you know, he calls out, uh, you know, there's a lot to go, there's a lot to focus on from just the box score standpoint alone. You have Luka, just a rebound shot of the 40 point triple double, Porzingis without a single field goal, but still dominant in other areas. Uh, KP and Luka combining for just 3 of 17 from 3, and then Hardaway going 6 of 9 in his regard as, again, we talked about his role and how he's really well integrating into uh, that third man role for them now since you inserted him into the starting lineup. And uh, the plus minus for Luka is really, really solid in that regard too. So a lot of good stuff you can focus on from there. Uh, He's you know, been an award-winning sports writer in Oklahoma for a long time. So it's one of those things too, where as far as that element of what I do, there is some uh, degree to which I look to him for kind of uh, not ideals so much, but kind of a uh, inspiration or something to that extent. So it's always good to talk sports with him and with the rest of my family too. A lot of them, they, they haven't, you know, they're in Oklahoma, so they focus on the thunder, but there's, they're starting to really pick up on the idea of Luka and why they need to be paying attention. So, of course, I was there to talk plenty of Mavericks basketball with them and answer all of their questions. Interesting note as well here on this. Um, this steps even a little bit outside of the Mavericks thing. Obviously, we talked about Luka's stat line and everything like that. But, interestingly enough, you had Trey Young going off as well elsewhere. He had 49 points, 6 assists, 1 rebound, 2 steals. He did have 9 turnovers, though, and he did play... 42 minutes compared to Lucas 37, but, uh, the area, I mean, it's two great players, right? Trey Young struggled through the first half of his rookie year. Offensively, he has been a force for the most part since then. And if not for the fact that Luca is Luca, I think Trey Young would be the one who is obviously leading this now sophomore class, like carrying the banner for this draft class. But it's just interesting to me. That again, I know DeAndre Ayton's going to be a good player for Phoenix. Uh, he's facing you know a 25 game suspension, or not facing, he's already serving it. But it, it is something satisfying for all those Phoenix fans, all the Suns fans, and their organization and their media people and everyone who basically said, you know, hey, this, you know, oh, we we made the no brainer decision. It's DeAndre Ayton, and then they would be telling you. You know, because they beat Dallas last year, I think they swept Dallas last year. They would say, "Oh, see, 
Luca, yeah, all right. He's he's not bad, but DeAndre Ayton's going to be better. They would they would argue that Ayton should have been in really the thick of that race for a rookie of the year, and it was only because of biased media coverage that Luca got the talking points at all. And it's satisfying in this case because they had to go watch Luca just ram- like ravage their team, just desolate wasteland, just level their team in that game. And it's Dallas won because of Luca. Obviously, like Luca controls the entire flow of the game, and it's something that while Rubio was still good for them and Saric was good, like they, they Phoenix is a good team. I, I've been saying this. Phoenix is a very good team, and they they were at the I think the eight seed with a, a five hundred record going into the game. I want to say, but uh, they they're going to be in the thick of that race. I think I think they have the talent to do it. Ubre twenty two points, 10, 10 rebounds for them. Uh, Booker. 18 and five in the past. He has been a killer for the Mavericks, like a Mavericks killer in that game. I remember the second game of the year, I believe it was, or maybe it was the opener. I think it was the opener where Dallas was right there in the game. And then Booker went insane and hit something like four straight possessions came down and splashed a three. And it took what was a very close game and turned it into a relative looking blowout where suddenly it was like 118 to 102 or something like that. When it had been just right there within a score or two. Uh, Ricky Rubio, 21 points, only one board, but nine assists, six of 12 shooting four of six from three, you know, people, people who wanted to be down on Luca going into the, into the draft, they were saying like, Oh, at best he'll be another Rubio. I understand Rubio hasn't lived up to whatever level of hype that he got coming out the first draft pick from 1990 from the nineties in general. Um, but I, he's still a quality player. Like I still like Ricky Rubio it's one of those things where I would not at all be upset if, if somehow he eventually wound up in Dallas, but it, it's just one of those things where I don't think the fit's necessarily there with Luca being what he is. So I don't know. I, I look at stuff like that, and it's just amazing to me. In then in the context of that radio audio you heard, radio audio, that's pretty redundant because, of course, if it's radio, then it is nothing but audio. If you hear that, you hear that clip I played earlier, then you think about kind of that perspective, and you realize – a lot of these guys have biased assessments and opinions on that. So it's funny that those guys who would have been dogging the hell out of Luca are now probably happy with Rubio when Rubio is decidedly lesser than Luca. And Rubio was considered a guy who had all this crazy hype around him. Not to the same extent, but a lot of crazy hype around him. And has had a good but not sensational career to date in the NBA. So I don't know. It's interesting to me just kind of how... You know, when someone's suddenly on your team, how you kind of bend your perspective and you try and bend over backwards to be like, oh, I always liked this guy's game. He's, he's a solid player for us. But, ugh, Luca, I wouldn't want him. Like, that's that's what you would hear from those guys. Like, oh, selfish ball hog and teammates don't like him. All right, dude, good luck with that. Uh, quick notes from the game here. Phoenix shot a better percentage, 44% compared to 41 for Dallas. Dallas three ball was pretty solid, 36% compared to 34%. Free throws were great for Dallas. Dallas had a point in the fourth quarter where I think in the fourth quarter they went something like 16 of 17 at the line. They were 15 of 15 at one point. I think Luka missed one. Uh, In free throws, they shot 33 of 38 for 87%. You're going to win a lot of games when you're getting that kind of production at the line. You're getting there that often, and then you're converting. Phoenix was 18 of 25 for 72%. Dallas, important here, Dallas protected the ball very well. Only eight turnovers for the game. Phoenix did well, too, with 10. Uh, Out-assisted 20 to 29. Tied in rebounds, although Phoenix got 11 offensive boards compared to nine for Dallas, even in blocks at three apiece. And uh, a couple techs each for each team and fouls, you know, pretty much the same there. Dallas 24 to 29 uh, had fewer. So, yeah, this is a, this is an interesting game here for for Dallas. I, I'm pleased to see them bounce back because, as we talked about, it had been so long since they'd gone and won in Phoenix. And they had struggled the last couple of years, even though Phoenix had been really bad, especially last year. They were really bad, yet they beat us down, and it didn't matter. It just seemed like... All right, well, we'll play it tough, but for whatever reason, we're going to struggle and we're going to make mistakes late, and Phoenix is going to hit some shots that separate it. And that's pretty much how it was playing out. Wanted to give a call out here on Tim Hardaway Jr., another number here. This is from Reese Conkle of Dallas Sports Fanatic. Uh, He calls out that, hey, everyone, (laughs) this is his tweet. Hey, everyone, just thought I'd let you know that Tim Hardaway Jr. is shooting a crisp 39% from three this year. Thanks. That's a really good call out. And again, we're early enough in the year and with his ridiculously hot stretch since being inserted 
inserted into the starting lineup, it's going to boost those numbers. But it's something to certainly take consideration of. When you're shooting like that, you're going to be able to be that third guy. And I don't think it's going to last. His career shows that he gets very hot, then he cools off, and then he'll struggle for a while, and he'll float in the median, and then maybe he'll get hot again. When you have it and it's working, it's great to have on the team because he can create his shot. He's not just a spot-up three-point shooter. Uh, as, as great as Dodo has been for the Mavericks this year, and to be clear, although I want to see more minutes for Justin Jackson, Dodo has very much, I think, elevated, taken another step this year, and I think between his defensive presence, his rebounding, and his even his three-point shooting has improved enough now where I think it's pretty much like a, yeah, okay, it should be Dodo right now. And, and I had said that even in the offseason. I felt like if Dodo didn't take that next step in terms of his three-point shooting and knocking down a reasonable percentage of those opportunities, which I think he was 30% last year, and that was the best season of his career. Uh, so there, there was a lot of concern there that he would be able to take that next step to be somewhere in the 35 range. I, I don't have his number right here in front of me right this instant for what he's shooting, but... I said if he could do that, then yeah, he'd be the hands-down advantage over Justin Jackson in terms of a starter and heavy minutes guy. But I do want to see more Justin Jackson all the same. I still think he can offer this team a lot that they haven't really consistently delved into. Uh, speaking of other guys that people have had frustration with, uh, this is from Brad Townsend on Twitter. He says, FYI, sitting here with Mark Cuban, who echoes what Rick Car Carlisle told me this morning. This was the morning of the game. Um... They love the way Dwight Powell is playing. It isn't the raw numbers. It's the usually positive plus minus when he's on the court, the opportunities for others that his screens and drives create. So as frustrated as we've all been with Dwight Powell, I was just bemoaning his performance the other night and really calling out like, dude, we need to have an honest discussion about his struggles because it is it is kind of dragging this team down a little bit. And I was calling for more Maxi, as a lot of people have been. They're saying, you know what? It's not showing in the raw numbers, but if you look at what he's doing, there's a lot there. Now, I understand plus minus might be usually positive. It's not the end all be all stat, though, and I feel like other teams are attacking him, particularly down low defense uh, with their bigs, and I think it's not usually working in Dallas's favor in that case. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings. If they want to give it a little more time to hope that he breaks through this at some point, fine. And I know he had a hamstring thing in camp, but it's like, okay, well, we're like six weeks into the season, so I'm going to need you to kind of get it together a little bit if you're going to get it together. Or if you need rest, fine, we'll give you rest. But whatever it is, you have to break through this. You have to break through this either now or at least stop hurting us in the meantime. So there's another uh, interesting call out there. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else I wanted to read off? Uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a comparison. This is from uh, Mike Bassick on Twitter as well. This is a comparison of October for Tim Hardaway Jr. versus November. And this feeds, I think, very well into the conversation again that I had of hot versus cold. And he, he can go very streaky on you. In October, he averaged 9.3 points, shooting 35% from the field, which is you know 2.8 out of every 7.8 attempts. That was basically his average attempts and uh, makes per game. 26% on three, which means he made only one and a half out of every five and 5.8 attempts. And in November, 14 points a game, 43%, 43.2% from the field, and 42% from three. Yeah, a lot of that is he has thrived as a starter. I think a lot of it is as well. He's gotten on a hot streak. Like, you know, we talked about those last five games. Those That inflated those numbers, but for the month as a whole, he was still a fair bit better than he had been the previous month. So I'm curious to see if this thing can kind of keep continuing a little bit. I'm not holding my breath. I'm hoping that maybe he does just perform better in the starting lineup than he has off the bench, even though he's been decent at that in the past. But we'll see. We'll see. There's no doubt that where he's playing right now is how they hoped he would play. And how they're going to continue hoping he'll play because they need it. They really need that role. They still have their issues, and it's the same issues we've been talking about. Uh, I think they still need a, a better five. And if Carlisle's to be believed, they are starting to consider using Porzingis as a stretch five, which puts him in more of those pick and roll situations, which could open things up a little bit more and get him more involved down around the basket instead of just having him camp out on the three-point line and hoping and expecting Luca or someone to make something happen and then kick out to him when they drive in and draw that man. So 
we'll see. But regardless, I'm pretty happy with this win. I'm happy with the state of the Mavericks right now. Uh, next game, they got Monday night, excuse me, Sunday night. My days are all confused. You'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm thinking it's Sunday. It's only Saturday. Their next game is uh, Sunday night against the Lakers at home, I believe. Let me double check this right here. No, excuse me. It's at Los Angeles, at Los Angeles, tomorrow at 3. And uh, that will be an interesting matchup for Dallas as well. We'll see if they can get vengeance for that first game. But the Lakers are the number one seed with a 17-2 record and on a 10-game win streak. So they are nothing to be trifled with there. Mavericks currently sitting fourth in the Western Conference with a record of 12-6. and six. Uh, tied with the Rockets in terms of record, but of course have the tiebreaker. Hey, here's another thing. I, I know, and I don't want to put too much stock in this right before I go, because I've bemoaned for a while saying, hey, divisions really don't matter in the NBA. No one cares about division titles, and the playoffs aren't even seeded based on division champions anymore. It's just the best record now. It's not like 2006, where you got your Spurs-Mavs matchup in a matchup of two 60-win teams in the second round instead of the Western Conference Finals, because, hey, they happen to be in the same division. Spurs won the division, therefore they got home court, and Dallas had to settle for being like a five seed or whatever they were. Not, not a team hosting in that case. So rather than dealing with that, divisions don't matter. But the Mavericks are in a stacked division when you consider the opponents. You have um, the Pelicans... Pelicans in there. You got the Spurs, the Rockets, obviously Mavericks. So it's a it's a pretty stacked division, and the Mavericks are undefeated in that division right now for whatever it's worth. Just considering the, the quality of opponents in that division, I'm going to say it's still worth a little something just to say, hey, we haven't lost any of those teams yet. So that's going to do it for my time. I've been DDP, as always. This is the Dallas Prospect. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Share the video, subscribe, whatever you want to do. And uh, until next time, remember, guys, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.